Hello, everyone. My name is Peter Rukin. I am a lawyer and employment mediator here in Northern California. And on behalf of IFSA, I'd like to welcome you uh, as we discuss mediation in the context of senior executive and founder disputes. So our goal today is to share insights about mediation from several jurisdictions. And while our focus is going to be on executive and founder disputes, we will also, by necessity, discuss some foundational mediation concepts and viewpoints of general application that would apply in, in other types of disputes, particularly other types of employment disputes. So with that said, uh, let me introduce our distinguished panelists. Ian Mill is a leading barrister and King's Counsel who has handled numerous high profile disputes in the UK and internationally during the course of his 40 year career. Among many accolades, Ian has been ranked to Chamber UK's top Silk Bar 100. He has variously been described as a fearsome advocate, an excellent strategist and a leader in his field who brings a huge amount of knowledge and pragmatism to the table. Ian is also most relevant for our purposes, a CEDR accredited mediator with a particular focus on complex commercial and high value employment matters. We're also joined by Jane Mulcahy, a distinguished silk in the areas of employment and sports law. Jane is currently co-head of Blackstone Chambers and head of its employment group, where she deals with complex and high profile litigation around employee contracts compensation, whistleblowing, and discrimination. Chambers and Legal 500 sing Jane's praises, describing her as brilliant with clients, incisive, and a first-class advocate who is highly effective and razor sharp on the facts. Jane is also a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and a CEDR accredited mediator. Also joining us from London is Yulia Fedorenko, a solicitor with CM Murray. Yulia advises both employers and senior executives on a wide variety of employment matters, including statutory claims and negotiated exits. Yulia also has experience with employment tribunal disputes and alternative dispute resolution, including both private and judicial mediation. Moving across to my side of the pond, we are joined by Anna Seed, a partner with SafeHearth. Although Anna is currently situated in New York, she is a Spanish qualified attorney who focuses on international employment legal matters around the world, mainly in Europe and Latin America. Anna has extensive experience providing employment legal support to multinational clients on a wide range of Spanish labor and employment matters and is one of the firm's thought leaders on the future of work. Anna is ranked in the labor and employment law category for Spain and best lawyers. Chambers calls her an excellent lawyer who is helpful, technically strong, thorough, and responsive. Finally, back in my home state of California, we are joined by Lynn Hermley, an employment partner with Oric based in Silicon Valley. I can tell you that based on personal experience, Lynn is one of the most respected and feared employment lawyers in California with a long and enviable track record of high profile trial wins. According to Chambers, she has a great strategic brain and thinks about all aspects of the case. In recognition of her career successes in the courtroom, Lynn was inducted into the American College of Trial Lawyers in 2017. And by necessity, Lynn is also a veteran of the mediation trenches, having represented clients in innumerable senior executive and founder disputes. So, let me preface my first couple questions for the panel with an observation. When I was a young lawyer uh, 30 some years ago, I would say mediation was less common. We were more likely as lawyers to pick up the phone and negotiate a resolution or attempt to negotiate a resolution directly with opposing counsel. You know, that was true when, when I started my practice in Chicago and then in New York but I think it was beginning to change by the time uh, I came to California around 2000. And now I would say that many, if not most cases are mediated, including pre-litigation matters. Uh, and so at least to me, it seems 
is if there's been some transformation in legal culture uh, that has that has led us to this point. So with, with that backdrop and to properly set the table, I'd like to ask several of our panelists, how common is the use of mediation in your jurisdiction and in your cases? And is the answer different if we focus on disputes involving C-suite executives or founders? So let me uh, let me start with Ian. So I, I would agree with you, Peter, that there has been a transformation in approach in the this jurisdiction uh, over the last twenty years. Uh, there is a perception, which I think is widely shared, that everyone should, engaging in litigation or contemplating litigation should give mediation a chance, unless it's one of those rare disputes where mediation is probably not going to be appropriate. And we could talk about that if need be. Uh, it's important to note, however, that it's not compulsory. Uh, and the full extent that the English courts have gone to, to encourage mediation is to threaten cost sanctions in the context of the litigation if there's an unreasonable refusal to mediate. But that's as far as the matter will go, although the court will especially if the parties ask for it on occasion, stay proceedings to give a, the parties a, a period of time in which to try and resolve matters through mediation. And my personal experience is the same as that which I've described as being generally the case. So I would say that every case I can think of pretty much in the last 10 years, at least, uh, there has been some attempt either before proceedings have started or during the course proceedings to settle through uh, a process of mediation, not always successfully, of course. Got it. Yeah. So, so Lynn, I, I'm curious what your perspective is, uh, you know, practicing in California. I, I don't know if you have the same reaction as I do or, or different experience. I agree with you, although my experience starts about 10 years before yours when I would say mediation was very unusual and there was perhaps only one respected mediation office in California that we all used. And in my practice, which is about 70% high stakes individual cases, 30% complex class actions, it's extraordinarily common. I would say that unlike Ian's experience, um, unlike what happens uh, in England, Britain generally, to my understanding, it is often mandatory. And the California courts, both the state courts and the federal courts will typically insist that the parties go through one form or another of ADR, alternative dispute resolution, and of course, the favored practice is mediation because some of the others, while useful in some cases, are typically not as productive. Settlement negotiations with the court, something the federal court out here calls early neutral uh, evaluation. So extremely common, but I have had cases in which the plaintiff refused to mediate We've attended a brief court-ordered settlement conference, and we've had to go on and try it. So I would say um, extremely common, but occasionally one slips through the crack. With respect to founder disputes, I would say I've never had one that didn't mediate because of the high state stakes nature of the, the money involved, the publicity issues, the emotions. Um, it's typically always the case, in my experience, that the high-level founders' disputes do mediate. Right. One, one thing I have seen over the last few years are contract provisions, particularly with executives and founders, where mediation is, is, a, a, is agreed to, in, in whether it's an employment contract or an underlying contract. Or document. Um, I don't know if you've if you've seen those too, and I, I don't know that it's really a question of people being compelled, you know, to to follow to follow that procedure. But certainly that that's that's the indication where it leads. 
Yeah, I agree. And, and it's in two major buckets that it's starting to emerge, both in the hiring agreement documents and maybe more important in the settlement documents. I'm a big advocate for arbitration of disputes arising from the severance or settlement agreements. And hand in hand with that many times is we will mediate formally or informally before we go through arbitration or in some cases, the court process to resolve those disputes. Right. Anna, um, what, what, what is your perspective on uh, how, how institutionalized mediation is in Spain? So um, very different to what we've been discussing until now. Unfortunately, it's in practice not very commonly used, although if you read the law in Spain, you would expect that every single case would be mediated because under the Spanish law, every employment dispute, there's a few exceptions for more urgent cases, but every employment dispute has to go to a conciliation and mediation stage before going to the employment tribunal, so the court. Um, and it's mandatory. So if you want to file a claim against the employer uh, for whatever reason, um, you first have to request a mediation meeting. It's called the Mediation and Conciliation Service, and it's, um, there are different administrative bodies in every region in Spain. And it's an administration, so it's not privately appointed by the parties. Um, in practice, yeah, it's there. You would request the mediation, but then what happens is that the parties would privately discuss uh, any negotiation, any possible settlement, but uh, the mediator, so the administrator that is actually carrying out um, the conciliation meeting would really not get into the, the, you know, the details of the claim. Sometimes I had a few cases where they would read the claim and say, well, I think you better negotiate here because you're going to win or you're going to lose or you should give something. But that's really, you know, minimal um, really minor cases. In practice, what would happen is they would ask the parties if they have discussed, if there's an agreement, if there is an agreement that will be stated and it would be binding for the parties like a judgment. And if there's no agreement, they would just say, you know, uh, mediation has been tried uh, and it hasn't succeeded. So the parties can now go to court. Um, that is in the individual claims. In the collective matters, so when there's a um, dispute about the interpretation of a collective agreement, remember that in Spain, every case, every company is subject to a collective bargaining agreement that is kind of a um, sector um, law that applies for, you know, for that sector or industry. Some big companies might have their own negotiated collective bargaining agreement, but it's like an additional law. So if there's a dispute about that, or there is an industrial claim um, dispute, like, I don't know, a strike or benefits or whatever claim, then you also have this mediation stage. And here we see a little bit more active mediation. So again, it's an administration. So it would be a formal body appointed by, um, you know, the region. Um, and then the parties would go there and there's an active attempt to, to, to get them to agree on something. So that is what I would call the equivalent mediation, but it's only in collective disputes. And also like th those two are mandatory. So before going to court, you have to go through that process. And there's a third option that it's more, again, in collective disputes where there's a strike or there's a, you know, a strong dispute, the parties can agree to, to mediate. And there you could see some room of choosing the mediator. You can, you know, those that are, you submit the agreement to this mediation or the possible agreement, the dispute, or the conflict into this possible mediation. But again, it's more in collective industrial disputes. Um, I don't really see these in, you know, funder or executive disputes. The parties are really, I mean, I'm not saying there's no negotiations or settlements, there's plenty, and there's a lot of pressure from, you know, in all the stages of the process to try to get them to a settlement, but not through mediation. It's just privately lawyers or the parties discussing with, with each other. Got it. And as I understand what you're saying, uh, disputes involving senior executives or founders are not exempted from the employment tribunal. Some might. So, um, Senior executives would be generally um, employment tribunal. 
some if the, if it's a board of directors, so it's more a commercial relationship that that would go to the civil uh, procedure, and there you could see some mediation, yes. But again, it's more typical that the the authorities try to put pressure on the parties to reach an agreement, and the parties negotiate between themselves, not through this mediation. That's not really often the solution. Got it. Got it. Okay, so Yulia, tell us about your practice and the use of mediation uh, in your cases. Thank you, Peter. Um, so uh, in CMRA, we advise senior executives and founders on various issues such as employment law issues and partnership law issues. Um, in terms of mediation, um, it's always a very useful tool um, to resolve certain disputes especially when uh, there is a lot of emotions involved. And normally that's what you see a lot with senior executives and founders when there is a dispute going on. And mediation can actually assist with resolving those disputes because a mediator essentially would facilitate an open and honest conversation between the parties and narrow down the gap, uh, which most of the time is, happens when there is a dispute between the parties. Uh, so definitely mediation is a good way to resolve disputes and uh, especially between senior executives. Um, and what I find very useful is that it speeds up the process because if there is a dispute and senior executive would like to bring a claim, it would probably take 12 months to 18 months for them to get their day at tribunal and mediation can actually uh, resolve the matter uh, within a matter of weeks or essentially facilitate further discussions. Okay, so I think we should turn to the corollary question, which is what are what are the advantages of mediation over direct negotiation, particularly in the context of, of disputes involving uh, high-level employees or founders? Um, and so, Ian, can I start with you? So uh, just a, a few observations from me. You can't compel somebody to negotiate with you directly, and I appreciate you can't compel someone necessarily to mediate with you either, but uh, sometimes people are prepared to mediate when they're not prepared to negotiate, and I have personal experience of that, where I, had, I ended up having to litigate because the person against whom I had a claim just refused to negotiate with me, but as soon as I issued proceedings, they agreed to mediate, and the matter resolved itself very quickly. Uh, I think that there are other circumstances or reasons why mediation is beneficial. Uh, for example, it allows somebody who's neutral but with particular subject knowledge, some ingenuity, creativity uh, into the process, and maybe uh, allow for uh, solutions that the parties hadn't thought of for themselves. It's also a way of making sure that you have the right people in the room. The problem with the negotiation may be that you end up having somebody that you deal with who just hasn't got the authority to uh, to uh, uh, solve the matter satisfactorily in any event. So those are a few thoughts. I'm sure other people have their own thoughts in addition. Lynn, what what, what do you think? what what are what are the advantages that you see? In, in, in taking your case to mediation rather than attempting to negotiate a resolution directly with opposing counsel? Well, the first advantage of direct negotiation is time. And with the developments that you and I have spoken about in terms of the popularity of mediation, I found particularly this year, it's very challenging to get a good mediator on board within the next few months even. And some of the great mediators are setting out well beyond six months. So there's an enormous delay there, which in a complex founder dispute is going to be very challenging. And um, not only is the mediator schedule an issue, uh, counsel will typically have trial schedules that are active. I'm desperately trying to set mediation in a very sensitive challenging um, executive case, and we've been unable to get a mediator aligned with the party schedule. So that's the first advantage. I think um, 
it's very common to do both in my experience in the same case. And what I mean by that, you go to a mediation, it brings with it all the advantages that mediation brings. You've got protection of the proceedings being admitted in the court case. You've got a third party who ideally is empathetic and able to um, bring down the temperature of the dispute. You've got the various other advantages, but it is time consuming and very expensive often. I recently um, selected a mediator after kind of a challenging back and forth. And then we got his initial bill for $25,000 for the day. And my opponent said, absolutely not. And I think he was right because it was a case that was going to take some amount of time and the bill would have been more than we were, the lawyers were charging their clients. So um, I think the real advantage that mediation brings that direct doesn't is the ability to have an ideally sensitive and empathetic person have the founder here, uh, have the founder um, spew or discuss or resolve a lot of the emotional issues through the process. And as we all know, some of these um, challenging founder disputes do require the resolution of the emotional issues that are all tangled up with the financial issues. So advantages on both sides, but I think personally, it's hard to settle a founder dispute with direct negotiation unless the parties are really ready, willing, and able to move on, which they often aren't. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And I think Ian, Ian had mentioned having people with authority present, decision makers present. And then kind of the, the flip side of that is having is being able to create a direct dialogue with with the principals at a mediation and instead of the communications being filtered yeah. through through counsel so that 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 is also an advantage that that is a huge advantage because there are some lawyers who are not as adept as others at advising their clients in the downside of litigation and most mediators are very effective at doing that and they're very effective at transmitting the ammunition that you've given them in your mediation brief. I agree. Yeah. yeah. So Yulia, what's what's your perspective on uh, the advantages of mediation over picking up the phone and, and working out the issues with opposing counsel directly? Um, well, sometimes with direct negotiations, a party can be at an impasse and no one is ready to compromise. So that's when it's really important to involve a third party who can actually facilitate the discussion and um, explain to the parties uh, or potentially just uh, help them to see what is the best way forward. But of course, sometimes direct negotiations can be uh, really fast and efficient. But again, when emotions are involved, uh, I think mediation is the best way forward because also during mediation, um, parties will have actually an opportunity to read out their statement to explain how they feel, which sometimes is really important to them, um, not just when their messages are being communicated through their solicitors. So mediation can really give them that opportunity and give them the closure. Yep. Okay, so I am curious. Uh, we've been talking about about the the ubiquitousness of mediation. I'm curious about mediation styles and what is what does mediation look like in your jurisdiction? You know, we often talk about mediator styles along a continuum from evaluative on on one end to facilitative on the other, and then there's there's also transformational mediation, which is not I don't think is really a thing in, in employment. Law, but um, you know, with with evaluative mediators, we're talking about someone, you know, in my world, it's like the retired judge who basically pounds the table, says, "Here's what you're going to pay. Here's what's going to happen in the case. If this goes to trial, you're gonna you're gonna lose, and this is what you got to pay, or you're gonna win, and this is what I'm going to get you, right? And and here's and here's what's wrong with your case, and what's right with your case, and then facilitative." 
you know, at the extreme end is there's no opinion really offered. It's just, it's just facilitating the discussion, carrying information back and forth, discussing, discussing scenarios, but not, not putting a, not, not having the mediator put a thumb on their scales, on the scale. So I'm curious, um, what, what do you typically see as a mediation style? Um, and Lynn, I'll, I'll start with you. I, I think there is little advantage to a mediator who is simply um, facilitative. I don't know what that transformative thing was. You mentioned, Peter, that yeah. one, that, that one hasn't hit me yet. But yeah, but I would say that the best mediators have a combination of both styles. They're both evaluative and facilitative. I don't know if facilitative, I guess, is a word, uh, but able to evaluate the issues and facilitate a, a strong negotiation that resolves all of the issues, including the emotional issues. I personally think that the best skill a mediator can have is a great set of people skills, interpersonal skills, and an ability to be sensitive to what is actually driving the dispute. And that isn't always money. Uh, in founder disputes in particular, as we all know, there are all kinds of emotional ties to somebody's baby, the business that they build. There are ties to the board seats that they have. And a, a great mediator has a complicated skill set, in my opinion. I think it's a hard job of being able to assess the issues, communicate the downsides, um, figure out what's driving the problem, and also understand the complex equity that is so common in most of these disputes. And in my experience, not every, not every even great mediator is able to do that and needs a lot of help in the process. Yeah. So Anna, uh, let me turn to you next and ask, you know, does, does the continuum I described, does that resonate with you? Would you would you typically see a certain kind of style in um, Spain? Yes. Uh, and I think it's mainly because the cases when, I, when they're mediated, and even if sometimes in individual disputes, when you get to courts, the, the court itself, tries to get the parties to reach an agreement. And that is kind of a mediation, like they interfere into the negotiations and, and that is more uh, evaluation. So like, here's the case and these are your risks and these are your risks. So why don't you get unsettled? Because you both can win or can lose. So you have your strengths and you have your weakness. So that's more how generally this is presented. And in the, you know, the more, formal negotiations, that's also the case, Look, like an initial evaluation, and these are the facts and, and how we see it, and this is the outcome that you would find if you go to court. Uh, but then, you know, typically the dispute is there because there's risk for both parties, so both parties think the, that they could win. Um, and then it's when we get to more facilitation of why don't you get to a middle point, why don't you give something and you give something and then you both are happy with the result, like someone, both parties have to win and both parties have to lose because, you know, if one party only wins, then, then where's the point? So so I think we we normally see that process. And I had examples of cases where it's merely facilitation and it just didn't work because, you know, the parties were like, yeah, but I think I can win. So why would I give anything, right? So so I think in Spain, it's really difficult to go to mere facilitation without first evaluating and saying, yeah, of course you have a case, but what about this, this, and this, right? These are your weakness. So, so that you really believe there's a point in mediating and, and eventually settling rather than, you know, just taking the risk and going to court. Yeah. So, so Ian, when we, when we were preparing for the webinar, you, you had a pretty visceral reaction to what I would call the strong evaluative approach in mediation. And that it sounded like that was not something you would typically see in the UK. It, it, it absolutely isn't. Uh, what I have seen as a party to a mediation, uh, and I have been persuaded to participate in mediations uh, from time to time by clients, uh, typically is purely or largely facilitative. Um, and from my perspective, and I agree with Lynn on this, that is thoroughly unsatisfactory. Uh, you need 
in my view, to have a mediator who is going to show energy and dynamism uh, and originality to try and assist an outcome. Now, I don't know necessarily that what you might term evaluative, which I understand to mean telling who's going to win and who's going to lose, is necessarily the way to go either. But I do think that having a purely uh, facilitative approach, which I have to tell you is what we are taught to do when we train to be mediators in this country, uh, is the way forward. And I have not become a mediator in order to follow that regime. I have decided because I don't agree with that regime and I want to do something different. Uh, I, so far as evaluate, evaluative mediation is concerned, I had one, uh, if I may just briefly tell the story, uh, one brief experience. I think I mentioned earlier on, I was a litigant uh, and my case went to mediation. Uh, it was in uh, Santa Rosa in California, near where I have a home. Uh, and we, we were in the mediation center there. We had a retired judge. Um, and within one and a half hours of me arriving, uh, I had uh, settled for twice my, the amount of my claim because his very visceral reaction to the respective merits of the two parties' cases. Now, I, 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 would, be, I would be hard pressed to say I didn't find that a good, a good outcome or a good approach. But I think that that approach is likely not to be necessarily the best approach in all cases. And I'm aware from talking to colleagues uh, that the, the sort of retired judge approach in the UK who comes in and says, well, I'm going to tell you who's going to win and who's going to lose doesn't tend to work terribly well either. As I say, I think you want something rather more nuanced uh, and uh, creative and somewhere between the two. And that's what I hope I can provide uh, in, uh, in my career as a mediator going forward. Well, and you're not alone, I think, in that perspective, because we took a, a poll in connection with this webinar on LinkedIn, and I don't know how many how many responses we got, but I have the results. And what was striking to me, one of the an proposed answers to the question, what kind of mediator do you want, was an evaluative mediator, some description of an evaluative mediator, um, you know, who tells you what's going to happen in the case. And only 5% of the respondents indicated that that's the kind of mediator they wanted for their dispute. So I think lots of folks share your perspective on that. But just to respond briefly to Ian's comment, in my experience, the mediator doesn't say one side's going to win and one side's going to lose. They tell both sides they're going to lose. And then, you know, you, you do your best to persuade the mediator to get a resolution that's more in line with how you view the case. So everybody's a loser, according to a great mediator. Yeah, that's true. According to a great mediator, but there there are mediators who who may be you know may have differing levels of effectiveness. Who and again, it's it's retired judges I've seen this with who, yeah. who actually will really pound one side rather than the other. And and I you know I don't think that's that's the way to go. It's certainly, what happened in my case. I yes. was under yeah. no illusion that I was going to win the case. And the only question was how what the size of the punitive damages was going to be, which I found thoroughly entertaining as an English lawyer who, for whom punitive damages is not something that we typically talk about. Yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit about mediation outcomes. Um, one of the oft-touted benefits of mediation is that it allows, and we've, we've mentioned this, it allows for creative solutions that a court or tribunal can't order. And so... I'm curious whether there are certain resolutions that you've reached in executive or founder disputes that fall into that bucket. And Jane, I'd like to, to pose that question to you first. Thanks, Peter. I mean, I, I also saw the poll and saw that the most popular outcome was that a creative mediator who identifies grounds for resolution that parties did not envision, envision. So creativity is obviously very important for everybody. I do think you can, in employment situations particularly, and founded disputes, use mediation to get things you simply can't get in court, which mostly is obviously damages or some sort of declaration. And we're not here talking about injunctions and things. Um, and so in that sort of, in some ways, quite a personal relationship, there are all sorts of things that can be sorted out, which you can't get from a tribunal which you might have in the UK or by a court. I mean, obviously, there quite commonly are apologies, heartfelt or not, um, references, 
greed, whereas most employers in uh, in the UK only give the briefest reference these days. Obviously, mediations can achieve more. Um, I had one particular case quite early on in my mediation career where what really the individual wanted was to report as a manager to an entirely different person because they couldn't stand their current manager. And I thought that was going to go absolutely nowhere. So it was more of a workplace mediation. There hadn't yet been a break in the relationship. And when I went into the other room to discuss it, I became very quickly aware that they weren't remotely surprised and probably thought that was a very good idea. So that's something you could probably obviously never have got in a courtroom. And in whistleblowing and harassment situations, which we come across frequently, sometimes people say and actually mean, not all of them, sometimes they say they want something, but really they just want the money and they forget along the way. But sometimes they do say, look, what I really want is this employment relationship for other people to be different from the one that I have had. And I have had in recent times an employer say, OK, well, you know, we will adopt a policy in this respect and we will incorporate this or um, we will institute a way of investigating um, things going forward, which are not the experience that you've had as a being, if you like, an add on or addition to also, no doubt, some money settlement. And so those sorts of things you really can't get through a court. Yep, I agree. Uh, Lynn, what, what are what are some resolutions you've reached? or seen reached in executive and founder disputes that that, that fall into the bucket of, of creative solutions? I think the equity issues are often better addressed in mediation than they are in court proceedings because of all of the um, various complications that go with trying to deal with those in court. Acceleration of equity and additional potential grants of equity which the board can do to resolve a dispute is a big one. Um, some of the other challenging things, for example, a departing founder often has board membership, committee membership on the board, things that are not easily addressed in the litigation process, but can be resolved in the course of a creative mediation. I do agree with Jane that apologies uh, are sometimes very useful in getting to a resolution. I had a case last year, it was a 30 year employee, not quite a founder, but she thought of herself as a founder. And about midway through the afternoon, I asked the mediator in light of the discussions, if we send over a message of thanks for all of her contributions, and you make clear that it has come from all of us here, and you mentioned a couple of particular achievements, is that going to be helpful? The mediator said it would be great. The mediator was a very uh, people savvy person. And that was a breakthrough in resolving all of the other issues. So I think Jane was spot on in that. And of course, the there are ways to address letters of reference, keeping people on a website, um, various characterizations of the reason for a departure. And all of those things, I think, assuming counsel or creative can actually help lower the amount of money at issue. Uh, although it often takes a while. I had one last year, a case in which the founders had literally come to blows and it involved name calling of people's mothers and all kinds of things that happen when founders are 20 years old, rather than what we're used to seeing um, in years past. And all of all of that is better addressed, I think, in mediation than the court process. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so uh, Yulia, what what do you, uh, what are some creative solutions that you have seen in, uh, in mediation, uh, particularly with, with, C-suite executives or founders? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I actually had a very similar experience to Jane. Uh, so um, our I was advising client on sexual harassment and part of her complaint was uh, the way organization treated her complaint and she was not happy with the policy and it's part of mediation, uh, which also included a financial settlement. She was allowed to uh, review the policy and comment on particular parts of it. 
which um, afterwards resulted in the review of the policy. So she made a difference uh, by, by doing that and actually also helped the settlement. So I think that is also the beauty of mediation because it offers the unique solutions that uh, courts and tribunals do not. Yeah, and I think I think all three of you are exactly right about the utility of having these non-monetary solutions uh, to the to the dispute. And there's always the strategic question of when you know when do you raise those? When when do those get surfaced in the mediation? But having having that on your list of of, of offerings to make uh, or requests to make, uh, I think is 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 very smart. Okay, so another driver of a successful mediation is the choice of a mediator. And we've talked a little bit about, about mediation styles and effective mediators, um, but, but let me ask, how do you decide when to retain a mediator? And then what other traits are you looking for in a mediator, particularly in the context of a dispute involving high-level company actors? And Jane, let me, let me turn to you first. Well, I think when, I think you were saying, Peter, and I think Lynn was saying also, I mean, I think the sooner that you see who you can, to be perfectly honest, if there feels like a right time, then, then give it a go. You can always do it again if you don't get it right the first time. Um, although perhaps another $25,000 a day, Lynn, we're not quite that rate in the UK. Um, but if you can do it, I mean, the good thing to do is, I think references for our recommendations and mediators are very helpful. Um, obviously, any um organizations which are reputable and those sorts of things i mean what you really want as we all as we all as are saying really is someone creative and i i don't think facilitative is actually just is just flopping around doing not very much i think facilitative is trying to help people get to a settlement whatever that takes and i think sometimes that can be waiting a little while and then asking a very hard question if you like so um you know yeah that sounds great but what about this so i think Someone recognise the creativity. I think it does help if someone is knowledgeable about the area. I don't necessarily mean the tech world or something. I mean the employment scene uh, and, and the things that matter. I think you should expect someone who's done their homework. I think people should have read the papers and they should understand the context. And I think a really important thing is what Ian referred to earlier, which is energy. I think you really want someone who isn't going to flag and continues to try and apply their brain to some something that just pops up that might work, whether it's an apology or a change to a policy or or an understanding that actually someone in one room just wants to talk to somebody in another room in order to bring a relationship to an end in a way that's effective and helpful if you can at least organize that. So I think all of those things and flexibility, that's what you're looking for. Um, and you may have to sometimes find that trial and error, I suppose. Yeah, so so Lynn or Ian, any any other characteristics that you that we haven't discussed already that you are looking for in a in a mediator? Uh, just an observation, not so much about that, but about the practicalities of appointing a mediator, certainly in this jurisdiction, is that frustratingly, uh, when one party promote, proposes a mediator, there are uh, numerous occasions on which the other party will deliberately say no because it's the other party's choice of mediator however suitable the person is now i have no idea whether that is something which you mm. find in in the in the u.s lynn but it, it's been a matter of tremendous frustration to me in the past because you can you can know someone who is absolutely ideally suited objectively because of their character because of their mm. knowledge because of their their dynamism energy and so on uh, and you just get frustrated because you can't impose your own choice of mediator mm -hmm. uh, on the on the dispute. And I find that inevitable, but very frustrating. Yeah, it's an interesting strategic point. My practice, verging away from um, high stakes founder disputes for one minute, is typically to ask the other side who they want and who they think would be good with their client. Because at the end of the day, I don't think my client and I really need an evaluative mediator. Uh, we need a facilitative mediator and we want a mediator the other side's gonna listen to. I, I don't really need to listen to the mediator. I've spent a lot of time in 
energy and tried to get my clients to the right settlement position. So I want a mediator the other side's going to listen to, unless they suggest an unsuitable mediator, I'll often go with that because I think we're going to get further with, with that issue um, rather than having someone I want. Although, of course, you don't want a bad mediator who's going to make things worse. To go back to the question of what else we haven't talked about in terms of mediator skills, I'd mention the equity piece for um, some of the cases. But to me, it's more important to have the energy that Ian has spoken of and something we haven't quite talked about, which is persistence. Um, persistence and determination and grit, as we say here in Silicon Valley, because a lot of times you're not going to settle on day one. You might spend 10 or 12 hours uh, working through the issue and you've gotten a third of the way through there. And even if you don't have another day of mediation scheduled, you want a mediator who's going to call the next day and say, what can I do? And continue to push it along. And I've had, especially I think in founder cases, We've made some progress in the mediation, but we've made significantly more either with the mediator in ongoing discussions or just the mediator prompting the lawyers to talk to each other. And in the most complex founder cases, it really does take, I think, a lot of persistence and determination to get the whole deal done. Yeah, it's a team effort for sure. Uh and I, you know, I've had, certainly had mediators who, um, and, you know, kind of the the other end of the spectrum is a mediator who, uh, it's, you know, it's it's two o'clock or three o'clock, and the mediator just throws up their hands and says, yeah. "Well, we're not going to get anything done today." And I have had cases where I've gone back and had a conversation with the lawyer on the other side, and we've settled the case. So. I, I I I agree with you that that grit and perseverance is is probably one of the top traits you're looking for. And what you just mentioned is the worst trait. The worst. It's worse than a lot of the other issues that could come up. Giving up easy is just not part of the deal here. Yeah. All right. We have a few minutes left, so I want to I want to turn to the final question uh, that I've got, which is. And we'll try to compress this a little bit given time constraints. Uh, best practices in preparing and conducting the mediation. So now we're, you know, we're on game day and we're in the mediation itself. And so some of the some of the issues we identified, and I'm, I'm just going to read them out, and, and then I'm going to ask uh, Jane Lynn and Anna to just weigh in on on any of these that you think uh, you have you have a comment about or perspective on. And so there are questions surrounding whether to share mediation briefs, or in the UK, I, I think they're called position statements with the other side, use of joint sessions uh, versus private caucuses, how you address confidentiality in caucuses, the role of insurance carriers in mediation, um, how contingency fee dynamics play into negotiations, and whether you draft, whether you circulate draft agreements with obviously with, with the monetary terms omitted before the mediation or during the mediation. So Jane, let me start with you. And if there are any uh, of, of those issues that you'd like to weigh in on, please go ahead. Um, just very briefly on confidentiality, make sources, as in everyone knows what the rules are. And normally in the UK, it's confidential between the parties and you don't pass anything on without permission as the mediator. So that's how it normally works. But my real bugbear on mediating is the things that pop up, which are things like insurance and um, and contingency fees. And it really would help a great deal, I think, if you're mediating and if you're a party, even if you don't tell the other side, to early on uh, mm -hmm. confess about the blockers, if you like. Because you can get to a point where a client might say, yeah, okay, I can take that. And I've had one recently. But the solicitor is still saying, well, that's really nice of you to decide to reduce your expectations. But I'm afraid if you settle, that's a success in your um, agreement with us. And you still have to pay us a gazillions of pounds. And that really isn't helpful. So if you can try and flush those out early and start beating people around the head um, quicker rather than slower, then that, that I think helps. Got it. And and Lynn, any any of the issues I identified uh, speak to you? 
Yeah, I agree with Jane, especially on insurance. You really do have to start that very early in the process because an insurer can uh, dispute whether a mediation should occur, refuse to participate. I, I think another practice that I've recently started doing more and more frequently is trying to speak to the mediator before the mediation and just let him or her know, here are some of the sensitivities here. Please don't push my client on this point. Please understand the insurance dispute that exists and how you can help us. And a fair amount of advance notice, if you could get the mediator to speak with you and potentially with your client, if helpful, often goes a long way into smoothing the path towards a resolution, in my opinion. Anna, well, one thing I'm curious about is, is the use of caucuses in Spain in mediation versus joint sessions. And I'm, I'm just wondering how, how common it is to have to spend time in a in a joint conference where all parties and counsel are present, or is most of the time spent in private caucuses? Um, so normally it's all joint sessions, but yeah, the splitting the parties and having separate, like more private discussions is always a way to kind of get honest feedback and actually get to the, you know, what's the background here? What what's the, the what's behind it and and get to the more level of of uh, detail in the dispute that normally in the joint session with the other party in front you don't you don't say or you don't want to say because most of the times in these cases the, the parties are always saving you know some things in case we end up in litigation so we, I don't want to disclose everything so having these more private discussions with the mediator are, are always a good way to get to the you know bottom line of what, what the party's interests and priorities are without disclosing it to the other party. Got it. So I think that's a good place to pause and and see if we have and there there are a number of comments in the chat which I can read, but I first want to go to uh, the the audience and see if there's anyone who has any questions. And so if you can raise your hand virtually, actually, whatever the case may be, if you have any questions, um, we're happy to, to 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 take those. Okay. So I'm going to just I'm just going to read a couple comments, uh, and this is from Anthony Sendall, senior executive and founder. Disputes are very commonly fueled by complex emotional and other factors rather than money. A mediator who approaches such a dispute from a perspective of carving up the pie rather than seeking a resolution of the real underlying issues is unlikely to be successful. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the the. The you know the, the problem with with uh, zero sum negotiations where it's just dollars moving back and forth and you're not kind of conceiving of the emotional content and the people um, that are involved uh, in the dispute. Uh, and Malcolm McNeil uh, agreed to that. Also, it may break the ice to immediately look at the things that would not be available to the parties in arbitration litigation that will bring out underlying emotional or other issues. I've done that successfully as, as later I can return to those issues and put value on them and to bridge the gap. All right, so I think um, I think we're pretty much at the top of the hour and it's probably a good place to end. So I wanna thank, first of all, I wanna thank our panelists for a very stimulating and engaging discussion. Uh, and also I wanna extend a special thank you to Claire Murray and her firm uh, for hosting us. It was it was a real pleasure. Um, and then before we go, I want to let folks know that the next IFC event on September 19th is in the calendar. So it's advising clients in the Media Glare in-person event, September 19th, 6 p.m. to 7.15 p.m. And it's at Fox Williams, 10 Finsbury Square, London. I would I would love to go. I'm I'm actually you know what I'm actually in Glasgow uh, on 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 the 19th, taking my son to the start of his program at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. Um, so but I so I but I'll be there and not in London. But it sounds like a great program. Okay, I think I think that takes care of it. Thank you so much, everyone. It was, it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you Take care.